This afternoon we'll deal with Lord's Day 28 of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 28. About the Lord's Supper and the church summarizes the Word of God there as follows. How does the Lord's Supper signify and seal to you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts? In this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat of this broken bread and drink of this cup in remembrance of him. With this command, he gave these promises. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely was his, blood, his body offered me for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. Second, as surely as I receive from the hand of the minister and taste with my mouth the bread and the cup of the Lord, as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely does he himself nourish and refresh my soul to eternal life with his crucified body and shed blood. What does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his shed blood? First, to accept with a believing heart all the suffering and the death of Christ and so receive forgiveness of sins and life eternal. Second, to be united more and more to his sacred body through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us. Therefore, although Christ is in heaven and we are on earth, Yet we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones, and we forever live and are governed by one spirit as the members of our body are by one soul. Where has Christ promised that he will nourish and refresh believers with his body and blood as surely as they eat of this broken bread and drink of this cup? In the institution of the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This promise is repeated by Paul where he says, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So far, our confession. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and boys and girls who belong to him. This afternoon then we're going to think about what the Lord's Supper celebration means. That institution of the Lord's Supper by, by our Savior. And we'll think about that in the light of the Old Testament Passover, which we also read about since Jesus' death was actually the fulfillment of the Old Testament Passover. The Passover lamb, specifically. That's why Jesus instituted it, the Lord's Supper right after he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. Those two are connected. And with every Lord's Supper celebration, Jesus, as the actual host at the Lord's Supper, assures those who take and eat the bread and drink the wine of three things. And we'll think about those three things here this afternoon. So I proclaim to you then, with the Lord's Supper celebration, Jesus Christ assures you of three things. I did this for you in the past. Secondly, I'm here for you in the present. And finally, I'm coming for you in the future. So with the Lord's Supper, Jesus assures us, I did this for you in the past. Maybe we've 
become so used to the Lord's Supper celebration over the years that we no longer think about exactly why we, as it says, proclaim the death of our Lord and do that the way we do. So it's maybe good to pay close attention to why we celebrate this sacrament the way we do, with some plates, pieces of bread for the communicant members to eat, and cups of wine for the communicant members to drink. Well, this sacrament was instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ the day before his crucifixion, and he was at the time in the upper room with his disciples, having had the Passover meal. Passover, the Passover was something that the Israelites had been celebrating for hundreds of years. But that Passover was, that Passover in that upper room was officially going to be the last one, the last real one. The next day was Good Friday. And the Passover would then be fulfilled and abolished for Christ's church. And that's because the Passover was a meal that foreshadowed the death of the great Paschal Lamb, to whom all the lambs offered over and over over the years pointed to. The Paschal Lamb being Jesus Christ. And as we, we read in Exodus 12, the Israelites were to remember their deliverance from Egypt with an annual celebration of the Passover then, every year. You remember how the Pharaoh had enslaved those Israelites? And how the Lord delivered his people from the tyranny of Pharaoh? How he opened the way for them to take possession of the inheritance, the promised land? promised to Abram already, the land of Canaan. And you also remember how God visited Egypt with nine plagues with which he affected the people and animals and the growth of the fields in Egypt. And how those plagues were then followed by the tenth one when he killed all the firstborn of people and animals in the whole land of Egypt. And that means that there was death there was death in every house in Egypt, from the palace of the Pharaoh down to the beggar's hovel. The Lord brought death over all of Egypt in order to free his people. You could say that the Lord actually also then saved his people from certain destruction in Egypt by means of a lamb. We read Exodus 12, where we're told how the Lord drew the attention of his people to that lamb of deliverance, and how he commanded the Passover every year so that his people would remember that deliverance. Four days beforehand, the head of every household was to choose and set aside a year-old lamb without defect. Four days before, you see, and in that way, the Lord wanted to ensure that the people were busy thinking about that lamb beforehand. That was a kind of a self-examination and preparation. And when the children played in the yard, they would come and look over the fence in that pen and to that lamb which was set apart from the others and they would know because their father had told them that the Lord made use of that lamb to bring his people out of Egypt, a lamb like that. And when the father or mother walked by that lamb during those days before, they would think about God, how God, too, had freed them from death in Egypt through a lamb. And when the day of Passover came, the father had to take that lamb and cut the artery in its neck, and another family member would stand there and collect the blood in a bowl, and that blood was then painted on the sides at the top of the door frame with hyssop, a branch of hyssop. And that signified that the blood of the lamb was the only thing that saved the people on that night when they were about to leave Egypt. The only thing that saved them from death that had washed over Egypt. 
The Lord passed through all of Egypt, including Goshen, where the Israelites lived, to strike down every firstborn of men and animals. If that blood was on the doorpost of a house, the Lord would pass over that house, hence the Passover. So congregation, the death which struck the Egyptians had also actually been a real threat to the Israelites too in Egypt. They had no right of themselves to that deliverance from Egypt. They were of themselves no better than the Egyptians, in fact. They were also sinners. Actually, their lives should have been taken that night too. So the blood of that lamb was meant in the first place to teach the Israelites not just to despise the, the Egyptians, look down on them, but to despise themselves too. And that means not their person, but their own sinful nature, their own sinfulness. God's wrath against their sins was just as great as his wrath against the sins of the Egyptians. And they humbly had to understand that there was only one way to escape the burning wrath of God against all sins. And that was to take refuge behind that blood of the Lamb. And they had to make sure to teach their children that life with God in the present would never have been possible without that deliverance from death in the past. So every year... With the Passover, God brought the Israelites to look back with wonder and gratitude and remember that the only reason they had life in the promised land was because of the blood of that lamb poured out in the past in Egypt. They were to remember the lamb that saved them in the past. Well, on the night when he was betrayed when he was about to love his people to the end and give his life for them, the Lord Jesus and his disciples remembered that deliverance from death in Egypt too. Peter and John were sent out and they carefully prepared the Passover lamb. The meal had the lamb slaughtered and had sprinkled its blood around the door frame and on the lintel and they roasted the lamb and prepared the bread and the cups of wine on the table. And when they came together that night to celebrate the Passover, the Lord Jesus knew that on the following day, he himself would give his lifeblood as the ultimate Passover lamb for his people to deliver them from death, eternal death. And so at a certain moment, he pushed aside the remains of the Passover meal and he took some of the bread which was still on the table and he broke it. And while he handed it to his disciples, he said, this is my body which was given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And there were the cups of thanksgiving were still on the, on the table there. So he took one of those cups or two of those cups and he gave them to the disciples saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And what he meant with those words was, I am instituting a new sacrifice of remembrance. And this sacrament isn't remembrance of Israel's deliverance from death in Egypt through the blood of a lamb. No, it's to remember my coming death, my death to deliver you from your sins and eternal death. I am the Lamb who came to take away your sins and to give you true life. The death of the Passover Lamb in Egypt made the old covenant between God and His people Israel possible. The Sinai covenant. But that was a, that, that was a weak and passing covenant. It could only show sin, but not actually show how it would be removed exactly, remo take it away. But I'm going to give myself up now as the better Passover lamb. I'm going to give my body and blood to make a new and better covenant with God. I'm going to take away the sins of my people once and for all. I'm going to nail the bond 
which stood against them, the bill which stood against them, I'm going to nail that to the cross in my body. And I institute this new sacrament, and with it I say to you that by my death, I have delivered you from sin and from eternal death by that sacrifice on the cross. Through eating some bread and drinking a bit of wine, I assure you that you share in my death for you in the past, and you can know that you have been delivered from all the guilt of your sin and fully reconciled with God. With the bread and wine, I say to you, look what I did for you in the past. Look what I did for you on Golgotha. See, congregation, this is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper the way we do. It's just a simple meal with bread and wine. A little bit of bread and a little bit of wine. And when we partake of it, Jesus Christ draws our attention to the glorious deliverance from death which he has obtained for us in the past by his death on the cross. And when we share the bread and wine together, we do so in humility. And he says to us with that piece of bread and that sip of wine, look what I did for you in the past. My body was broken and my blood poured out for the complete forgiveness of all your sins so that God could be your God and you could be his people. And you realize then, brothers and sisters, that when we take that piece of bread and that sip of wine at the Lord's Supper, it should fill us with awe and with joy. We can lift up our heads with thanksgiving. Even though we deserved eternal condemnation and death, through that bread and wine, we may say we can share in Christ's sacrifice for sinners and we may have life and have it abundantly through faith. So when you take part in the Lord's Supper next month, think of what Jesus says to you as you eat that bread and sip the wine. He assures you, I did this for you in the past. I did that for you. And that's amazing grace for us sinners, congregation. And if he did that for you and me in the past, surely you'll be precious to him now too in the present, right? And that brings us to the second part of the sermon with the Lord Jesus, with the Lord, Lord's Supper, Jesus assures us, I'm here for you in the present. So congregation, the Lord Jesus Christ not only died for us, but he also rose from the dead triumphant. And as our living Lord, he ascended into heaven and from heaven he sent us his Holy Spirit, the Helper, to be with us always. And that's what the exhortation in the form for Lord's Supper is about. We're urged not to cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but to lift our hearts on high in heaven where Christ our advocate is at the right hand of his heavenly Father, the place of power. And then it's added, let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with Christ's body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him, quoting the Lord's Supper form. So the Lord tells us that when we eat the bread and drink the wine, he says to us, in fact, I'm, I'm here with and for you in the present just as certainly as you eat the bread and drank the wine and they go into your body and nourish your body, so certainly do I remain with you in the Spirit and nourish your soul with my body and blood so that you can continue to live for me wherever you are and whatever circumstances you are at work, in hospital, on the road, at home, wherever you are, I will nourish and strengthen your soul so you can continue and grow in faith no matter what. I am with you, in you. In this, you know, the Lord's Supper is a lot like the Passover too. 
the Lord gave more specific instructions about the Passover lamb in Exodus 12. After the lamb had been slaughtered, its blood taken, that lamb was to be roasted whole over the fire. And then it had to be fully consumed. If it was too much for one family, it had to be shared with the neighbors. And the people were to eat it with cloak tucked in and sandals on, with staff in hand, ready for the journey ahead. So the Israelites ate the lamb that had given its blood for their lives. After its blood had been used to save their lives, its meat nourished them for the, the trip ahead. Fed and strengthened by their eating of that lamb, they could leave Egypt and begin their journey to the promised land. And that journey wasn't going to be easy. It was through the wilderness. We've seen that here too. There would be many disappointments and trials, but strengthened by that lamb which they had eaten, they could joyfully set out toward the land of Canaan. That lamb represented for them that the Lord was with them and would take care of them. And that element of being strengthened for the journey through the wilderness was incorporated in the Lord's Supper by the Lord Jesus. When he instituted the sacrament in place of the Passover because the bread and the wine aren't only so that we take to heart Christ's sacrifice for our sins on Golgotha in the past. It's also a meal in which spiritually hungry and thirsty believers look to their crucified Savior in faith to receive nourishment and strengthening in their souls from Him for in the present on their journey to the promised land, the heavenly Canaan. And that's, that's how the catechism speaks too. We confess in question and answer 76 that eating the crucified body and drinking the shed blood of Christ means to be united more and more to a sacred body through the Holy Spirit so that though Christ is in heaven and we here on earth, we are flesh of His flesh and bone of his bones, it says in Lord's Day 28. And that means we're, we're joined to him spiritually. That means that when we take in the bread and the wine at the Lord's Supper in faith, Christ truly is with us, lives in us with his life-giving spirit. And just as certainly as bread and wine nourish and strengthen the body, so certainly are we strengthened by the spirit of Jesus Christ in our souls so we can continue on our journey in this life, through this life. And we actually have a hard journey, mentioned that already again too, through the wilderness. The way ahead of us is going to have not only joyful times, times when we're in an oasis, so to speak, but also disappointments and trials and temptations. Worries about work, money, future of our children, family trouble, concern about health. Sometimes the, the things we need to deal with, the obstacles on our journey here look way too big and, and our faith is too small. We can fall into complaining against God, something like the Israelites did in the wilderness when they became thirsty or discouraged or hungry. But then you see again how important the Lord's Supper celebration really is for us too. Because at that table you can, with the mouth of faith, that's how the, the Belgian Confession puts it, the mouth of faith, receive the spiritual food and drink you need, your soul needs, to continue toward the promised land. Your soul is nourished there by Christ's Spirit just as certainly as you eat and drink there with your physical mouth. And doesn't that make you spiritually hungry and thirsty as you look ahead to, the, to when you can take part in the Lord's Supper celebration again next month? Well, with the breaking of the bread and the pouring out of the wine at the Lord's Supper in remembrance of our Savior, the Lord says to you, look what I did for you in the past. 
And when you eat that bread and drink that wine in faith, lifting up your heart to him at God's right hand, he says to you, and now I'm here for you in the present too. From heaven, through your taking in that bread and wine, I spiritually nourish and refresh your soul for your life here, now. And so our Savior will then bring us to where we could never go on our own strength, eventually into the eternal rest where he wants to bring us in the future. And that brings us to the last part of the sermon with the Lord's Supper. Jesus assures us, I'm coming for you in the future. Congregation, the Passover was also a, a feast which contained an element of joyful looking to the future. That eating and drinking at the Passover had to take place in haste, as if in a hurry, staff in hand, sandals on feet. And that was to encourage the Israelites to look ahead, to look to where they were going, the future. Especially also then the end of their journey. They had been delivered from slavery and death in Egypt by the Passover lamb. And now they were free to make their way to the promised land of Canaan. Well, at the Lord's Supper, Christ declares, I did this for you in the past to redeem you from sin and death. And he says, I'm here for you now to nourish and strengthen your, your souls by my spirit. But he also says, I'm coming for you in the future. He also instituted the Lord's Supper to bring us to long for the eternal feast that we'll enjoy with him when he comes again to bring us into the promised land. And because the great deliverance from sin and death has taken place on Golgotha, and Christ lives and accompanies us with his spirit on our journey now, we can hardly wait to get to the promised land in the future, can we? Sin and all its effects and the struggles it brings into our lives are all going to be completely done away with. The time is coming when Jesus is going to come back for us in His glory, in all His glory. And then all sorrow and struggle and pain and sickness will be finished with. Our battle with ourselves will be over with. There will be just perfect feasting and joy with God and the Lamb forever. That's where we're headed. And that's what the, the Lord's Supper calls our attention to, to that eternal feast. And that day is coming. The Lord Jesus himself promised that it would. At the institution of the Lord's Supper, he commanded his people to remember his death until he comes. The Lamb of God is going to return to the earth in glory and going to take his own to himself in his eternal rest. And that's what he says. I'm coming with every Lord's Supper. I'm coming for you. And that's also why the Lord instituted the, the Lord's Supper to keep us longing eagerly for the day of his return and our entrance into his glory. And he assures us every time again at the Lord's Supper celebration, I'm coming for you. I'm going to bring you, my bride, to the wedding feast. So, congregation, there isn't much to see at a Lord's Supper celebration, really, is there? Call it a feast. Not much with the physical eye. Each participant takes and eats just a little piece of plain bread and has a little sip of wine. But whoever eats and drinks in faith will be tasting and consuming great things. Great things. And they will hear their gracious Savior say something like, see what I did for you in the past. And know that I'm sustaining you in the present. And you can be sure I'm coming for you in the future to take you where I am. And doesn't that assurance of those three things make you look forward to the Lord's, celebration, Lord's Supper celebration every time again, every two months? Amen.